I am unashamed. What about you? So I told you I went to um, Illinois uh, this past week and really enjoyed it. You know, these these guys, and it was a men's event, so it was really good. But we were doing our marriage retreat, which we've been doing for 22 years uh, at WFR, which is pretty amazing. And so I was telling somebody this story because they asked me, because there's people now, you know, used to, it started out, it was just our church, you know, people going, just taking a weekend, strengthening your marriage, strengthening your family. And uh, that was kind of the genesis of it. But now because of our podcast and because of our live stream that goes all over the world. So we have people come in from everywhere. I mean, to, we were up in, you know, close to Hot Springs, Arkansas, but they were, there was a couple there from Minnesota. Um, there was a couple there from Michigan, uh, from North Carolina, from Florida, from Tennessee. I mean, these are, and some of them have been coming a while, but a bunch of these just came for the first time, which I always found fascinating because I was like, you know, I'm not much on just taking off cross country to go to something where I don't really know any of the people there, you know, except for seeing us. I mean, I just, it, I, I marvel at, you know, the faith it takes to just take off someplace and go do something. So it was really interesting. So I was talking to some of them, you know, that know us from the podcast, but I hadn't met them. And uh, they, they asked, they said, well, does has Phil or Jason, you know, your brothers ever come to the marriage retreat? And I said, well, it's funny you say that. Mostly everybody's busy doing their own thing. But oh, I, I went. I know, you have. Uh-huh. So I would say one year, everybody came because Dad was speaking that year. And this was years ago, one of the early ones. And, uh, of course, we're all so uh, xenophobic about our food. You know, we don't like to eat a lot of food out you know we're just kind of like our well, own that's thing. the number one deterrent for any trip for me because i said what are we what are they doing about the food right what are we it's going she's like oh no it'll be fine i was like i want to know a detailed description <laughs> of where the food is coming we, from. <laughs> and we got that that was that was uh lived in front of us by you dear old dad because you just weren't much on you know eating outside of miss k's or your cooking and so we just, that's the way we all are. I mean, it's hey, just. One of the biggest arguments Missy and I ever got into was, you remember when we did that cruise uh, thing? Oh, yeah. I was going to bring my fishing stuff. And she's like, you can't fish off of a cruise ship. And I'm like, <laughs> why not? This is America. And if it's not, we're going to be on waters that are used by everyone. I'm fishing off that ship. Some of the greatest fish you could ever eat are swimming around. She's these like, days. you cannot do that. I'm telling you. I'm like, well, let's try it. And she's like, why would you want to do that? I was like, cause I don't know about the food. <laughs> I want to have some means to catch my own food. And I said, if that ship goes down, I want to have something. I'm grabbing one of my poles <laughs> and, and perhaps a little, <laughs> Flotation device. Yeah. Flotation. At least I would have something. I mean, I just don't like a plan where if it all goes south, including the boat going down, well, we just die. <laughs> Give me something. I mean, you, you, you'd appreciate a hook and a line. When do we make it? That's right. So so the one year we all went, I don't know if y'all, y'all probably don't remember this. So mom had like two ice chests, and she had like a – honey baked ham in there and then she had potato salad she'd made and all these other things and a couple of pies and so she took him in ice chest and so mom and dad's room every time all the marriage retreat would go to the place to eat we would all go to mom and dad's room and it was you and missy will and Corey, me and lisa and y'all well then word got started spreading through the ranks that we had secret food (laughs) that mom brought so people started like following us and so we were just like they would be standing in the hall we just closed the door because we didn't have enough for everybody i mean it was like (laughs) well because look i mean i hate to say this most places when they put on an event or something and there's a large group of people the the, the bigger the amount of people the harder it is to have so they do things that are practical and not necessarily good right but and so i you know i got a problem with that i'm like if we're going to get together and do anything the number one thing that's going to make this go smooth is what we're eating that's right 
That's gonna make you're gonna you're gonna feel way better about discussing the points of your marriage if you're well fed right. and satisfied. That's right. I'm not I, being spoiled. It's just a fact of life. Right. I, mean, I agree. This is it. So you mentioned the cruise. That was I hadn't thought about that in a while. So we our family we got we they asked us to do a cruise, a ship, and we were the like the draw for the cruise. And it, of course, this is back on the show. It it sold the whole boat sold out. Three thousand people. Yeah, in they, like five minutes. Yeah, it, they were fans. So the thing was, but it, all of us had to do it. And of course, so Willie comes to me and he's like, "Well, I mean, we're all on board for this cruise, but I hear that Phil's not wanting to do it." And I said, "Well, you know, it's definitely not his thing." He said, "Well, we can't do it without him." And so they, so they send me in, Dad, because, you know, the Phil Whisperer, there's, you got to go talk to Dad and get him on board or we're not be able to do the deal. So I go in, and I'm telling Dad a little bit about it, and he's just giving me the look, you know. And then you, you said, let me get this straight now. So we're going to get on a boat, and we're going to sail off, you know, on the seas. I'm on the boat with 3,000 people. I can't get off the boat. I'm there. Well, you could, but it probably yeah, but wouldn't make it. It wouldn't be easy. Without some kind so of this is your telling me. You said, why would, I, why would a man do that? Why would I ever want to do that? And this is why they sent me, Dad. And I said, well, Dad, because every morning you're going to be leading a devotional shipwide, and the people can't get off the boat. You're going to be able to, you know. There's no escape. There's no escape. You're there. (laughs) And you're actually surrounded by water. You're surrounded by water. I said, you're going to be, and you were like, you said, you looked at me, you pointed at me, you said, I like the sound of that. (laughs) And so. Well, we all do mission (laughs) trips. I mean, when I went to Greece, there was nothing about it that was appealing, especially with my claustrophobic tendencies. And And you you got sick on the ship, too. I get sick sick on ships. If I can't see the bank, I, I. Something something happened. If my memory serves me right, it worked because they were crowded into a location they couldn't leave, and I introduced Jesus. No, no way out except through Him. And if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, I think we baptized about five hundred, uh, hundreds of people, and it was amazing, Dad, because <laughs> you were you were doing a Bible study at about seven thirty in the morning. Because they had all this other, you know, ship stuff all day. So we, this was an add-on. You were doing that. Fifteen hundred people were getting up at six thirty in the morning to to file in there to hear what you were doing. And then about after day two, somebody said, "Well, can we get baptized?" I said, "Well, we're floating on the Caribbean. Now there's a lot of water." I said, "But we'll have to do it on the ship." I said, "I don't. You know, I guess we'll just do it." They had a pool. Yeah, and they had a series of pools. So we started having like baptisms. So we were. At 10 a.m., we got baptisms at the Lido deck, and it started out with just Dad, and then Larry was there. Larry's in the pool. Martin gets in the pool. I get in the pool, and we're baptizing hundreds of people. It was yeah. it was quite the happening. Some of the preachers contacted me later. They wanted me to meet with them, so I go down there to about 30 or 40 of yeah, them. Yeah, a group of pastors came on. Yeah. yeah, and they said, could you do a, a seminar, you know, speaking? I said, you just heard one. <laughs> that was the seminar. <laughs> Isn't that typical about preachers, though? They always want to have some kind of workshop it on, yeah, on what seminar. just happened. Do you do How seminars? Because just... we just saw 500 people. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. what, just do what I did. I said, just get up and do what, do what you heard. Uh, workshops are actually sometimes just doing the work. That That's is right. the shop. That's yeah. right. Let's shop the work and then just get after it. Which, by the way, and I learned on that from then on. Now I have me a little, it looks like a handle. I carry it wherever I go. It's in my truck. And I got string. It's an emergency fishing kit. So right. it's just a it's a stick with some string, and it's a hook. So what's interesting, though, is when you try to take that through airport security, they say, what is that? <laughs> It's an immer- emergency fishing. That was uh, from one of our sponsors. That, that Yeah, they yeah. said it. Yeah, oh, yeah. it's a great idea because yeah. you never know. I mean, don't underestimate line and a hook, <laughs> especially when you're hungry. Yeah. So we had a, so we're leaving the retreat uh, yesterday and we had this young couple that had come from North Carolina 
and their podcast listeners, Michael and Malia. And so Lisa invited them to lunch. So we were going to stop, but it's, you know, we're in Arkansas. There's not much around where this thing is. So I'm driving with it's Sunday. This place is closed. That's not open. The only place it was open is an hour wait. And I had to get back and watch Super Bowl. And so we were like, I don't know what's here. So the only thing that was open that I could find was a Taco Bell. So I, I pulled in. Oh. <laughs> it was. I pulled in. Now that's when you needed to do some fasting. Yeah, it would have been a good day. But we had this couple. We wanted to visit with them before they headed out. So, so he said, my wife said, are we really going to Taco Bell? And I was like, do you see anything else open? So oh, They were closed because of the Super Bowl? I guess. I mean, there was oh. nothing open. Huh. It's a little old town. And so... We ate at Taco Bell. Of course, I had already told him I was going to buy him a meal. I said, man, nothing but the best for y'all, you know, Taco Bell. <laughs> so I, I didn't know any of the stuff because I've I'm, I'm never eaten there that I can recall. And so I don't I mean, know about any of the things. I'm, I didn't know what to order. When Willie and I were teenagers, we had a little, we used to save all our money because since we was out in the country, right? going to town and eating at a restaurant was like, Ooh. <laughs> Which we never did growing up. So we would always do the older. value right. deals, you know, buy 10 tacos for, you know, $4 or whatever. So it, but back then it was about how much you could eat for as little money as possible. <laughs> Jason, <laughs> Willie, Dad would pull their money. So they'd have like $11.20. And they'd pull in at the drive through I was with them one time. I watched how they did it. So it was like, so they would order, and they'd say, how much is that? Because now it's on the screen, but in the old days, the person had to tell you. And they were like, uh, that's $8.30. Okay, all right, so then the, we're going to get, all right, what if we have four more tacos and this? How much is that? Well, that's ten fifty. So you so still had about One of us would be counting all the coins <laughs> down so. to the exact penny. So it was like, what can we get for 45 cents? <laughs> well, you can get a, a chalupa. <laughs> <laughs> or a cinnamon stick. All right, we'll take that. So it was like it spent right up to every cent they had. Whatever you had, you spend it all. <laughs> and you'd always, then you'd say, okay, no soft drink. We'll make that a water because back then they'd give that to you free. That's right. Yeah. And you're yeah. like, you don't want to be wasting money. <laughs> Oh, you'll just drink. drink water. Now, is that water coming out of the sink, or is there actually some water? Eating out with the rednecks. That's why I miss you. She cannot stand it. Every once in a while, I'll be in some situation like you were, and they're just the, – the, everyone is getting restless, and they want to stop somewhere and get – because I, you know, I packed me an ice chest with yeah. all what I eat. Right. But they're like, they don't want that. They just, just stop, just stop. So then when I stop in there, I'm like, okay – She's telling me what she wants, and I'm like, did y'all brew this tea today? <laughs> and they always, they're like, what kind of question is that? Why does that hang on? Let me check. You should know this. You should know off the top of your head whether that tea that you have in well, that first container. first you got to ask, is it brewed tea? Because now well, they make this instant stuff that well, just you exactly. can't, it's, it's not fit for drinking. But some of these people who are working there, they don't even know the concept. I'll, yeah. I'll say, do you brew your tea? And they're like, let me check. You got to. I'm like, baby, let's get out of here. Right. If you have to check on whether the they tea was brewed, the test. you walk. You've been working there how long? Of course, what's funny is one time I said, "How long have you been working there?" And the guy's like, "This is my first day." And Missy roller eyes. She thought, "Now, Jace." <laughs> I was like, "Let's you get just get one of these customers." You know, that I said, "Here's what I'm looking for. All I want to know is, is the did is the tea brewed?" Was it brewed today? That's all I need to know. Just answer those two questions because because Missy's like, well, go ahead and give the rest of the order. I'm like, no, if those two, either one of those answers are no, we're not we're not eating here. <laughs> That's what I was trying to explain to her. She's like, why are you making that? Why are you having this conversation? I'm like, because this is a deal breaker. Yeah, and let's take a break. So uh, in the... I don't know if it was happening. I guess it was happening before the pandemic, but a lot of people now are eating food that's delivered to their house. Uh, you know, for a while it's delivered like from fast food places and all that. But a lot of companies have started up that really make good food that you can cook, you know, because a lot of people don't know how to cook, which is unfortunate. So they need to be able to have some quality food. So you got these companies that have started doing that. And one of them is a sponsor of our podcast. And it's, uh, it's called uh, Martha Stewart and Marley Spoon. 
course, we've all heard of Martha Stewart, and she's kind of been known for cooking and, and things like this for many, many years. So they have these meal kits that they are going to deliver to your house. And uh, right now you can take advantage of exclusive offer, $120 off Martha Stewart's favorite recipes. So you're going to use the uh, promo code Phil. If you're tired of going to the grocery store, you don't like planning for meals, you don't have time to cook, these guys are who you need to check out. MarleySpoon.com. Use the code Phil for $120 off your first five boxes. So that's MarleySpoon.com. Use the promo code Phil. $120 off of delicious meals from Martha Stewart every day of the week. Check them out. So the the guy Michael he's he had eaten at a Taco Bell so he was having to tell us what what everything was, but then he said something that made me nervous because I'm fixing to be driving for three hours and he said yeah, they say they're saying that their little tagline is run for the border but it should be run for the baño, <laughs> meet in the bathroom and I was like uh oh, is yeah, this you took it for the team there <laughs> but I didn't have any problems it was all good and and we so I wanted to mention the Super Bowl did you get to watch the game I watched. Like the second half, yeah. I was I was scouting for our next TV show episode, and so I got back for the second half. I was kind of I was more excited about this one, probably going back to when the Saints were in a few years, fifteen years ago, whenever that was. But I I was disappointed. But then, you know, you don't really love anybody. I was pulling for Burrow, obviously. But then, like, there were some really good stories. Like, Andrew Whitworth is from here, and, and we know him. He's such a good guy. He is. So I mean, he got him man of to... the year in the NFL. Yeah. So it was, you're not, you know, you, I was just hoping it was a good game. I mean, deep down I was rooting for Burrow just because all the stuff with the LSU. And, right. But, hey, Whitworth, that was that was awesome. That was a great moment. And we know his, his – uh, you went to school with his wife. Yeah, you know Willie did. I mean, she's a, she went to school. She's from out this way, and so I, it was great. That so there were a lot of good stories. I even thought about Stafford. You know, I mean, he all those years he played in Detroit, and you know they didn't even make the playoffs maybe one time. And he's always been a pretty decent quarterback. And then well, he, I don't think they ever, they, they hadn't been in the playoffs in years. Yeah, I think yeah. one year I think they they played the Cowboys and lost, but that he was there. But so it was kind of neat for him. It was kind of there were some good stories involved. But I always enjoy the Super Bowl. Watching the, getting everybody together, watching the commercials and all that. It's pretty fun. So, oh, we just watched the game. Missy, she doesn't watch the commercials or the halftime show. Did, did you like the halftime show, Dad? Did you? <laughs> that was a, we didn't watch it. <laughs> but, I, I, looked at for the, those I looked at the gyrations and I just said, well, I just want to. Why do you do this? To, I mean, my wife, she's like, now look, we're just watching the game when I walked in. Yeah. I said, okay. So like when the commer- she didn't watch the commercials. The commercials were pretty good. Yeah. She didn't want to watch the commercials nor the halftime show. So I mean, she turned it off during the halftime show. She just like because I guess ones in the past I couldn't even remember why she was. She's like, well, I just were, don't. I want to watch the football game. They were all West Coast. Well, I guess they weren't all West Coast rappers. They kept saying West Coast rappers. Oh well, but they were all rappers. So it was definitely nothing I'd ever heard of before. But yeah. I will say this. The people that were there seemed to enjoy it, but you know, I I never it it stayed on the whole time, even though we were talking, wasn't really paying attention. Well, she doesn't it's just watch not my the, not my cup of tea. Well, we just she didn't want to watch it just because in the past they've you know had wardrobe malfunctions oh. and issues. She's just like I don't even you know if I want to listen to some music, I'll put on some off. contemporary worship music. I had to turn it off a few years ago because I mean my grandkids are there; they love watching the game, and I don't. It's two or three years ago there was two women. They were the main thing, but I mean, I mean, they're just, it was obscene. They, they needed were. some more buttons. They needed some more buttons. They, they needed something, you know, out there literally pole dancing. Yeah. So that's when I was kind of like, mm. yeah. Was, what, I'm kind of like, Dad, what's that have to do with football? So, Dad, you, you mentioned uh, before we started rolling uh, that, read that text you had from, was it First Timothy 5? I thought it was oh, really, yeah. really interesting what you said about that. Because, our podcast, you know, is really reaching a lot of people. And I know everywhere I go, and it's young people, like a lot of young people are listening to the podcast, which is awesome. I love that because, I mean, that's why we do what we do and talk about the Bible. It's, but, uh, but you found a verse I thought was interesting. It's 1 Timothy 4. Uh, the Apostle Paul talking to a young preacher, command and teach these things, verse 11. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. 
but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, in purity, until I come, and this kind of stood out. I never had quite zeroed in on it. Devote yourselves to the public reading of scriptures, to preaching, and to teaching. Yep. I found that pretty amazing that uh, what we are participating in at this moment is the public reading of scriptures. Right. 2,000 years later, that's what we're doing right here. I never had got that. It kind of knocks out the concept that the preaching goes on only on Sunday mornings. Mm -hmm. in one he spot. was told to devote himself all the time yep. to the public reading of Scripture. So I would say 2,000 years later, way in the computer world, what we're doing here is actually very biblical. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll show you, know you wait to Sunday morning to give a, a sermon, and then you don't show back up till a week later, four or five a month. Yeah. A month's quite a while. Well, you know. And he wanted these scriptures to be known to the public. If they'd have had the internet, they'd be doing what we're doing. That's right. But I know. Every day, I keep going off on Sometimes this, we but, miss that. Yeah. But every church I meet with, it seems like they're not getting, I guess they don't listen to the podcast. But every time I go there, they're like, oh, I'm glad you came here to meet the Lord. And uh, they, were, they were saying it yesterday. You know, I was like, you know, I'm glad you came to the Lord's house. I was like, this is the Lord's house. We are the Lord's house. I, I know thinking it. of all the verses. I'm not going to meet him. I know it. We've just changed locations, but we're still we're meeting the Lord every day. I mean, he's the the mystery of godliness is. I mean, Christ when he says devote you. yourself to the public reading of Scripture, that means uh, it's not. Maybe you might go out down the street corner and say a few words. Get out there amongst the people. I think we're doing that right now. That's what we're doing. Uh, we're feeding, yeah. We're devoting. At a faster rate than he had. Yep. Exactly. No, I was going to say out at our bed and breakfast, we, I, I showed you this yeah. this morning because I got, just, before just. the podcast, so this, I think a couple stayed there, but their son sent a note for them to put up on the mirror, and it was, this is what it says from a 13-year-old guy. Uh, I love your podcast. It helps me a lot. I am Jonathan. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. It was on the mirror. I, I, love it. Bread out the, at, uh, I the had one place. last week, according to Dan the eunuch, because I don't read them, but he said, some guy said, Mr. Robertson, I dislike you. <laughs> no, well, this was an actual letter. You're talking about social media. Well, that that happens, yeah, which sure. you don't even know. Yeah, so, but what what's fascinating about that, Jay, is so we don't listen to the podcast because we do the podcast. So I I don't really I don't know how people get it. I mean, I know how to go find it. But I'm saying so. I keep hearing people say they'll say I can't wait for my notification. So I kept hearing notification, notification. About the fifth one, I said, "Tell me what does that mean." Because I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I don't know what it means now. <laughs> I know. So I was like, "What? what is a, how are you, you're notified. I was, I understand what the word notification means, but so what, what happens? Tell me what happens. So he said, if you subscribe on YouTube is where he gets it, our podcast, he said, or, or somebody else said another thing. So it, it like dings on their phone or their computer, new episode of Unashamed. Oh. Well. And so what, which I think is fantastic so they're like, I'm waiting to hear that notification, you know, so I can dive into what you guys are talking about. Really, technology has, I mean, just that we're doing things now right? that you just wouldn't have thought is possible. You would get something on your phone saying, hey, this new episode's out. Right. So that means that four days a week, you know, the, all of our listeners who subscribe to these different places to listen or watch our podcast, four days a week, they're devoting themselves you know, to us reading our devotion of the public scripture, you know, exactly what you were talking about. So, I mean, it really is a practice, a daily practice of what we're talking about. You said, boy, uh, yeah. I bet when y'all get off the next day, they're still getting off. It, it <laughs> they just, it keeps going <laughs> and going and going. <laughs> well, for us, when we're not doing this, like Jay's doing a TV show, dad's releasing a book. I'm speaking, I spoke, you know, four hours last week outside of that. So I have a few events coming up too that were postponed because of COVID. 
because obviously I didn't want to do a bunch of events when I'm doing the podcast and the TV show and just living life, trying to live life. Yeah. Dan told but, me this morning, when you get up this morning on Monday at 6.30, you have an audience you're picking to speak to over the Internet. So we got already uh, at 6.35 or 6.40. Sorry, let's move this up to 6.30 this afternoon. I'm like, okay. Got <laughs> <laughs> to slap another said, hour. Well, I say, too late to go back to bed. I just. Yeah, yeah. That's, I hate that happening, Dad. That's, it's oh, hard yeah. enough to get any sleep. It happens all the time. I know. It's just kind of sometimes we don't get the information. But let's take another break. So one of my uh, favorite sponsors uh, of our podcast is a group called 40 Days for Life. We had uh, we actually had uh, the, the main guy on our podcast. On our podcast, and he told us a lot about what they're doing, which is fantastic. Um, they've written a book, and it's called "What to Say When: The Complete New Guide to Discussing Abortion," which is really interesting because people say, "Well, you know, I know that's not something you know people you know like talking about," and yet a lot of people talk about it, you know, pro and con. And so this book gives you some really good pointers. And Sean uh, does the book with a guy named Steve Carlin. Really excellent, very knowledgeable. Uh, these guys are on the front lines. Uh, they're in over a thousand cities in sixty-five different countries. So, they're what they're doing is making a difference. So, check them out. What to say when the complete new guide to discussing abortion, how to change minds and convert hearts in a brave new world. You can go to forty days for life gear dot com. You can get twenty percent off all the forty days for life books and gear when you use the offer code duck. So that's a great way to support an important cause. 20% off all books and gear with the code DUCK at 40daysforlifegear.com. Well, and I was going to add add to that what you read, the Great Commission, when we closed out the book of Matthew uh, a couple of months back, when Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, in other words, nowhere else are you going to get anything what you need except from me. Therefore, go and make disciples. Go. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and I'll always be with you. And so the idea is Christianity, Jesus left here for us to go with it. Yep. Not to keep it or stay with it, to go and even yeah. it was interesting because even the disciples, they missed it at first. I mean, they were so excited. It was so great. that, And it was so popular in Jerusalem that they didn't want to go. And he, te- he tells them when he leaves in Acts 1-9, look, Judea, Samaria, and the earth. Plus, uh, they were all just kind of hanging on while he was here. I don't know. I'm, I'm going up to Jerusalem, going to die, be buried, and raised from the dead. He was telling them that. But none of them were running around really and hollering about that too much. They just like, oh, you know. Right. But they 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 didn't take mean? off then and say, guess who I'm running with? Guess what he's fixing to do? No, they they were sort of low key. Right. Once he left, and they all got to look at him post resurrection. Spent yep. forty days well, to say. I think that was the key statement. with Thomas. <laughs> they were like, oh, oh you, wait a minute. Yeah. He, he can't die. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's when the speed. That's when the effort speeded up. That's right. Well, because fear. Ordinary unschooled men out on the corner hollered publicly. Yep. That's what the apostle Paul was I mean, telling fear, him. Go I, out there. I hate to say it, but fear is a major motivation with people. I mean, there there are people literally scared to even be social. Look how many people they reached. Look, look you know? how many people they reached. Without the internet, yeah. Just think about it. You know, ship going here to there. You know, shipwrecks. I mean, all kind of storm. He, that's what Paul had it rough. People yep. after him all the time, put him in jail. Yep. So you talking about? And they still got it out. Yeah. Do you think about? I, mean, I think the number one thing they gave their life for, for it. The number one thing for young people is the fear of not being accepted, and. uh you know, it's 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 like that when you're when you go public and you're you're bold. I mean that we we kind of laugh about it because we've been persecuted for years. 
But a lot of people, that's a big deal. I mean, if somebody, that their image means everything, especially in our social media world. And for you to buck the system, and I mean by the world standards, that's terrifying for people. And even back then, hey, they had the same, you know, every, everybody has that, they want to be liked and they want to be accepted. And they sure don't want to buck the system if it means you being put in jail. Almost every time they do a poll <clears throat> that says, what's your number one fear? Almost every time that's done, the number one fear is speaking in public. Yeah. To stand in front of an audience and speak or to yeah. be in a situation where you speak out. The, the cancel culture crowd is nothing but corrupt attention seekers. Right. But they to their credit, they figured out what moves the needle. Yep. If you, because yep. people are terrified of being persecuted yeah. or made fun of or that's right. or being canceled. That's I mean, they're, you would think that wouldn't work. I mean, because somebody like me, I, I'm too far gone. I'm like, ah, go ahead, cancel me. I remember seeing one when you that poll, same poll, and they'll do it every few years, but it came out, it was in the 90s when Seinfeld was doing his show, and he had a bit on there. The number one fear was fear of public speaking. The number two fear was death. And so Seinfeld said, so if you're at a funeral, most people would rather be in the casket than speaking yeah. at a funeral. And there's, <laughs> I, I was like that for the first 17, 18 years of my life. I mean, right. I, I didn't want to say anything out right. loud. And I, I don't know. I just didn't want to. I'm shy. But I think that's one of the draw has been to us is because we seem fearless because we're not afraid to talk about it in any setting. And well, I mean, we're talking dead people coming from the from the ground. Right. I mean, I'm like, I had the same thought as Jesus's closest disciples as I was researching this for myself, whether, I, you know, trying to get to know who Jesus was. I remember thinking to myself, are you kidding me? When he said, look at my hands and my feet, that was a noticeable passage. I remember in the early days when I was trying to find, you know, the truth, I just thought, this guy was dead, and he was like, look at my hands and my feet. I mean, look, it's I myself. I'm not a ghost. I remember whenever, <clears throat> Chase, you were still in high school in the early 80s, whenever Dad was getting asked to go speak to a lot of D banquets and things like that. I mean, you know, you're just building the you know, public persona of Duck Commander trying to get our business off the ground. And, you know, most of those are fundraisers, and so people are drinking and it kind of just turned into a drunk fest most of the time. And so you would get up and do the duck call demonstration, but you just weren't comfortable there because you had left that yeah, life. That's right. And you weren't getting to talk about what you really wanted to talk about. So you kind of moved away from that. And I'll never forget the first time I remember hearing you publicly talk about Jesus was we were in the Superdome. Yep. And you were standing underneath a big Budweiser sign because they were sponsoring the event. And you said, and you had about three or 400 people listen to you. You went through your duck call demonstration. They loved it. You did the, the high ball, and then, you know, duck doesn't sound like that. And at the end, you pulled out your Bible, and you said, oh, anheuser Bush, I mean, he really is the king of beers. I used to drink them back in the day, but I quit all that. And you, and then you started telling about the king of kings. And it got real quiet. It got quiet. I'm, I'm sure your sponsors <laughs> really got quiet. That's right. And then, all these guys. Are, I gave all this up, boys. All these guys are drinking. Well, all of a sudden, everybody puts their beer down. They're like putting it under their chair because I mean, it just like you know, it was a showstopper, Dad. What was the gig we went to? And <laughs> we, 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 they, they were flying us around or whatever. Yeah, it was one of our we, big sponsors. We went to a casino. Yep. We went to a yeah, casino and. Story. It was a party, but boy, you shut the party. Shut the party I, ne down. I never seen a but party that was die. More, that was more recent, and everybody knew you. But what got me about the one in New Orleans is you had never done any. I mean, it was a bold step for you because you were there for your business, but you just went all in on Jesus. And when you walked off stage, Oh Dubasson, who was our guy down there, I never forget. He he, because I was just a you know, I was just a you know, 20 year old person myself. So I was right out of the world with myself. And he said, Phil, you can't do that. Yeah. You can't do that. And you were like, do what? He said, you can't mix in your business and your religion. You lose both. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that was his take on it. But then you told him, he said, did you not hear what I said? You're not listening. 
because I talked about dead men coming out of the ground. I talked about sins being removed at the cross. I talked about living for eternity. He, you said, I, I, I have to talk about that. And it was really interesting because in my mind as a young man, what that meant was as we go forward with this business or anything else, Jesus is always going to be number one. So you instill that, you know, which was a good thing. By the way, Al, that paid, on, that paid rich dividends in more than one way. That's right. More ways than one. Exactly. But that's what was so hypocritical. I mean, even in the when we did our little show, we were just wanting to be ourselves. And, of course, you know, we, we – were, we were in for a rude awakening that they had an agenda that they wanted us to like perform under. But we kept saying, well, if God is, is for this, you know, it'll work. If we stay true to ourselves, it'll work. We can reproduce it. And, but the more research I did, and we talked about this one day about Hollywood, you know, the top 30 grossing movies of all time, none of them are rated R. Yep. Zero. Because everybody, when you, your perception of Hollywood is, oh, you have to, if you're going to be funny, you got to be dirty. If you want, you know, people to watch, you got to, you know, have people's heads getting cut off and whatever and immorality. You have to give your soul to the devil. And all that stuff. But then when you just kind of look at the facts, I mean, don't you find that incredible? The top 30 movies, gross make money makers, they were either PG or PG-13. Which tells you that the whole other thing was more about agenda than it was about making money. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't doesn't make sense. Why why are you trying to, you know, to change that? I mean, if something's good, even if it's putting its faith and trust in God, which then you get the qualities which are P G. Right. I mean, they're actually G, God, but right. you know. <laughs> and and you wanna represent that to the culture, and they're like, oh, that'll never work. You got to dirty it up, you know, to be funny. It's impossible to be funny without being dirty. Right. That's kind of the mindset that we run in, ran into. But it was, <clears throat> it was really kind of our last discussion on the last podcast. When the evil one convinces you to choose to, as what was your phrase, you set apart in your heart yeah. some pathway, then that's the idea. So if he's going to take over some institution – and, and it's going to start putting out filth and something dirty, that's the that's who's behind it. It's not even the people pulling the levers because that doesn't even make any sense. Yep. You're not making as much money. People don't even want to see that. It's so weird. We're like, well, we, we think it's funny when we make fun of each other. But, see, they're looking at it from like, well, you can't make fun of each other because you want to be sensitive to their feelings. But we're like, well, if you have the big picture on place. That's right which is that we're all going to live forever and that we're all flawed. You, we we make fun of each other. You think about what we did on our show. That is where the humor comes from. And we do it on here. We yeah. do it on here, too. Oh, I mean, I... We throw I mean, each other on the bus. All my brother's idiots. Uh, you do something <laughs> stupid, guess what? You did something stupid. Right. We laugh. and But nobody's over in a corner saying, oh, no, my brother called me stupid. I don't know what I can do. I'm, you hurt my feelings. And we do Words dumb, hurt. Yeah, we do dumb things, but we all know we love each other because the love is such a greater foundation, this unconditional love. You start trying to define unconditional love. Nothing you can do that's going to stop us from loving each other. That's right. So if that's the basis, yeah, and we're going to mess up. Right. So why not have fun with it on on the way? No, I think you're exactly right. And I think that was a big appeal about the way we are. Because, I mean, I would joke about Jace or Willie or Jeff or any of my brothers, <clears throat> or even now Phyllis, who's, she's new, but it's the same thing. I mean, I, I, but if someone attacked them, like was seriously attacking them, whether it was their character or whatever, I would be the first defender. Um, so it's because I, the love, the unconditional love is there. We grew up with that. I mean, and that's that love lasts always protects. Exactly. You protect them. Right. But you're right. It, it's that that's the whole idea behind the woke stuff, Jace, is that that's where people land, you know, in that world, which is terrible. You know, then it's all about, you know, you hurt my feelings. You well, and then you get into, you got to throw freedom of speech out the window. Right. Because you don't want to ever offend someone or say something. I mean, it's just like, well, what is the list of things we can talk about and make fun of and be 
you know, be fun. Right. Have have comedy. Well, the list is getting shorter and shorter by the day. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> they're they're pretty much putting comedy out of business because you know nobody knows well, what they get. Differences. Can... You know, we're all different. And, yeah. And in our that's kind of what we make fun of. And as we realize that we're all part of the human race, but they're like, nope, you can't do that because people get their feelings hurt. Right. You know, and we we'll send them into trauma. Yeah. Start changing the names of sports teams and. Well, <clears throat> it just never ends. Hey, the first thing I did when I came to Jesus and heard the gospel, my feelings were hurt. <laughs> <laughs> and they needed to be, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> Repentance time. Uh-oh. Somebody, I think it was Ryan Lee, said at our, our marriage retreat this weekend, he said something that was really good. He said, because he was talking about, you know, doing things that are uncomfortable. And he said, you know, but you, I want you to look back at your life. When did you ever grow? when it wasn't uncomfortable. And that was a great thought because yep. you rarely grow in moments of comfort. You usually grow when you're uncomfortable. I mean, yep. wh whatever the growth is, whatever the, the means is. But It's you know, the it's ones great. whose feelings are never hurt that they don't come to repentance. You have yeah. to have hurt feelings to do that. Right. You know, what am I doing here? And you got to have point. brave people being the willing to stand and up. And call it out. And, yeah, and, and be practical about it. You I talked mean, about that with parenting. I mean, that's the ultimate in boldness is to tell your child who you're seeing go down a bad path. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh-uh. We're not doing that. That's not, that's not the way we act. That's not, that's I mean, not our way. With that's, the way technology is now, everybody goes to their rooms, give them a device, and they live in fantasy world. Even the parents. Yep. And there's no interaction. There's no uncomfortable conversations and no right. awkward moments and... I mean, what you want to have happen is just have the conversation. Yep. So to do that, you, you, I mean, one of the most novel ideas we had from, from doing the show was that why don't we get together and just show what we do on a daily basis and have a meal gathering around the table. What was so crazy is the production people, their response to that was like, oh, this is revolutionary. We're actually, I mean, we're going back to something not seen since the Waltons here. We're going to show. For the TV uh, world, this is history. Yeah, I mean, let's get on the cutting edge. Ground, <laughs> we have an idea. Let's have the family gather around together, not in separate rooms, not scattered, and eat and talk. <laughs> Without phones, having conversations. And thank God for the food. Oh, Bob, this is revolutionary. <laughs> what if people, I mean, this this could be groundbreaking. <laughs> you were there. That's why they were That's acting. I was thinking, because yep. they said, how often do y'all do this? Phil said, what? <laughs> how often do you, he said, do what? They were like, like gather. gather around this table. Where'd you get this table? They were even looking at the size of the table. It's like, who, like, who has a table this This day? is what we do every day. We <laughs> we eat a meal. Now, we may not all get together. Right. We may actually do this autonomously in our own individual homes. We get together. But that's where you have these conversations. No, I, let's take a break. No, I described it, Jace, as, and it's not just where we were when the show was being made. That dinner table was the way we grew up. So people ask me all the time, well, the things y'all do on the show, you know, is that was all that stuff was happening in real time. I said, well, some of it was, but a lot of it was stuff that we grew up doing. And we got to retell the stories as adults. But trust me, in back in the day, it was a round table. You remember, it was a round table with a bar going down the side of it where the phone was. And so it was a pecking order of, even how everybody sat at the table. Mom sat closest to the stove where she'd get the food over there. Granny sat next to her, and then it was Paul, then it was you, and then it was me, and then it went Jason down the line. And that was the way we lived. Everything important that we learned, we pretty much learned at the dinner table. When the further in you were, the that's when you got into the pieces of the chicken. <laughs> that's that, right. Because there was a not, pecking order on the food, too. <laughs> It was what you was know, left. it's sim simplistic, <laughs> but you say most family structures, they don't take the time and don't have the wherewithal to go in there and eat a meal together. Right. It, it, it's we Now, Jace described You remember when we had Adam Carolla on the podcast and he talked about that? Yep. He talked about, he said, you know, my, my kids get home, I never see them again. 
Everybody's in a different room. And he was describing what probably most homes in America are like now. Well, you got to be intentional. I mean, you're not going to, it's not going to happen. I mean, you have to, I think as a spiritual leader of your family, you got to go in there and, and have these family service announcements, which I mean, <laughs> here's what we're doing. Yeah. And they're, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> and so whether it be, you know, turning your phones off or having a station, I mean, all the things, I just look at all the things we've done because technology is catching up. So, I mean, it's such a, a pivotal part of our lives now. I mean, that, I saw the other day, my son, ironically, was telling me that now Amazon's coming up with these stores to where you just go shop and you, there, there, there are no checkouts. They... They know you, you. It's some kind of subscription thing. Yep. And they have monitors that are make. They're they're able to scan your product from a distance. So whatever. So you don't even have bucket, to run it across the scanner. No, it's- you don't even run across the scanner. You go in the store, pile your buggy up, and leave, and they send you a bill. I was like, "What? <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing here? <laughs> that's gonna work. That's what they're gonna do. That that's what he was telling." Well, me. I've been seeing some of that happening in big cities, but it wasn't Amazon. It was it CBS might, and Walmart. For Walgreens. me, a country boy that spends most of his time outside, I was like, "Mine blown." <laughs> but I liked it because it t- saves time. Yeah. Which anything that saves you time becomes a valuable commodity in well, our culture. I don't Dan, I don't know <clears throat> when's the last time you've been to Walmart. But. Uh decade. <laughs> well they have a totally different system. They have a thousand people in there and then they have two checkout people. <laughs> That's right. By design. Because right. you're like, well I would go check out and leave, but you look up there and like, oh nah. I'd have to wait thirty minutes in there. So let me go get some more stuff. Or let me just go get another buggy. <laughs> you see people, they're hauling two buggies. You're like, what? They're trapped. But here's you can't the, get out. So Jay's no way to check you, out. I don't know if you noticed this. So now because the pandemic, so people got used to they they go online, they order their food, what they want. And so now when you go into Walmart they, or neighborhood Walmart, there's a there's all these big blue things in the way. I can't hardly walk around. And it's people that work for them putting food in these big buggies. And then they bag it up and they take it out. Somebody just drives up to the on the computer. Here's what I want. They The guy gets it at the store. He loads it up in this big huge buggy that's every all over the store and then he goes and puts it in your car and so that's the another thing that's kind of come out of the pandemic but the bad thing is jace is right you can't hard just to go shop as a normal person i'm a walking i can't get around the people who are delivering the to all the people out in the cars or i can't get checked out and you're wondering why i don't go shopping <laughs> well, well that's why i wondered if you were doing a lot of shopping you know you got dan right you send dan that's what that's what dan is doing when you send him in that's right that's what he's navigating that's what we do we say dan go go get us this and that and other and he'll take so off. you're bypassing the internet you just got dan everybody needs a dan i guess Exactly. What did this have to do with First Corinthians? Well, this ne- we never got to First Corinthians. <laughs> we went off on a rabbit. <laughs> this was, running across this was the, the rabbit that ran and ran. <laughs> but, well, I just, I was going to make a point about when people see us have this meal, I think that's what we were talking about. I, w- I was talking about how much. Well, that's how I was like, going to tie like it in. I remember well, now. yeah, when, when you go on trips, I'm like, what are we eating? But here we have this meal that's symbolic that that we do, like where we all meet, that we do it once a week on the first day of the week on right. Sunday morning. We, you, know, you have the cracker and the juice, which the Corinthians were had missed the point. They were getting hung up on the actual meal rather than what it represented, which right. is where we were going to go with that. Right, <clears throat> and we ran out of time. Um, but I, we'll at least introduce it. That way we can talk about it next time. Because out of that, remember he told, we went into that first part of chapter 10 where he's like given the warnings from Israel's history. But then he made the point that you made. I think the key verse is no temptation has seized you except what is common to man, but God is faithful. Mm-hmm. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. So he's like, you don't have to give in to this thing you said in your heart. You don't have to do that. He's given you the strength to say, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. 
So then he comes back and says, therefore, flee from idolatry. And that really becomes the whole thing that we'll get into it, because then he makes the comparison about the feast of idols versus the the feast that we know as being the Lord's Supper, which he's going to talk about later in chapter 11. Some individuals, they thought when he said, unless you eat, eat my flesh and drink my blood, I'll, you have no part of me. Right. And they're like, I don't know, he's in cannibalism. They, yeah, that's been a big thing. For well, years. and he explains that in verse 16. I and mean, we can read it. It says, is yeah. not the cup of thanksgiving for which we get, give thanks our a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break our participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Which It's a dual meaning. Yes, you think about the body of Christ when you take that. That was broken for our sins. And you think about the blood running down out of his body on the cross that saves us. But it also represents that we're all members of one body. Yep. Of which he is the head. Right. And in a world back then and now that people are so sensitive and they get their feelings hurt, and I, we bring all our differences together at the foot of the cross, and we participate in this meal together. It was his, his idea. And then he gets, he's going to get down to the end and say, <clears throat> look, if you're doing something that, that you're free to do that may offend your brother or sister, I mean, don't do it just for the sake of the bigger picture, right. even though they're being way too sensitive. Right. And I think that's a good model for us, even yeah. in our world. It's hard to, because you want to just say, hey, put your big boy pants on and quit acting like a weenie. Right. You know, but I mean, there is something to be said about overlooking that for the sake of the kingdom and waiting for people to grow up in Christ. Yeah, and putting it in the proper perspective and place. All right, we're out of time. We'll, in the overtime, we'll talk a little bit more <clears throat> about the supper, sort of the meaning it was then, and also what we do now. And uh, I want to tell you about something we do at the marriage retreat that's really cool So uh, around the supper. So we'll do that in the overtime. Uh, we'll, we'll come back and pick up here in First Corinthians 10 next time. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.